Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you that we have uh, enough health and energy to be here uh, this afternoon, and we pray, Lord, now that I would, in a real sense, get out of the way and that your word would do its work. Uh, I pray that I would, uh, you would help me to forget the things that are not going to be helpful for your people. Help me to remember the things that will be. And I pray now specifically for those who may not know you, Lord, who may be wandering, who may be wayward. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring them near today, that they would find home in you. And so we thank you for all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. And amen and amen. All right, I was reading a book this week called uh, Atomic Habits. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a, by a guy called James Clear. And in it, he talks about how small atomic habits have made a humongous change in his life. And so he was in a bit of an accident. He was a baseball star in high school. He was, a, he was uh, you know, on the road to go uh, into varsity, junior varsity and then varsity and then pro. And then while someone else was at bat, the bat got out of control and hit him right between the eyes. And he, it was a long recovery for him, years of recovery for him. Uh, and he ended up actually getting into college and getting a scholarship and actually becoming quite good in, on his baseball team. And he, he credits that to very small changes that he made. Very, very small atomic habits that he enacted in his life that gave a huge dividend at the end. And this idea of having small things actually pay off in a big way. You've all heard about how an airplane, if it shifts its, its, its nose just one degree on the tarmac, it'll end up in a whole different place. And in this book, in Atomic Habits, uh, James Clear, he does, the, he does the, uh, the math for us, the maths, as you say in Australia, the maths for us. So if you have an Airbus A380 in LAX, on a tarmac, ready to take off to New York City, it, all you have to do is shift the nose of that airplane 2.5 meters to the right, and it's going to end up in Washington, D.C., just 2.5 meters, right? Those are like two and a half steps. And it ends up in a whole different place. These small changes make a huge difference in the end. Shifts in this direction or that will make an enormous difference in your life. And the stories that we choose to tell ourselves, the stories that we've inherited from our family of origin, from our culture, all of these things that shape our imagination, small shifts will make long-term changes. And if you want to imagine in 10, 20, 30 years, the narratives that shape us, small shifts in them will make a world of difference. And our text today is going to ask us to make three shifts, three quite significant shifts in our thinking, in our being, in how we actually follow Jesus. It's going to ask a lot of us today. And I, uh, you know, I, I battled with this. I said, how much do I hold back? And I, I want to just give it to you and say, whatever the Lord chooses to do in your life today through this word, may he do it. May he do it. So let me give you some background here. What's happening before this text? What is happening in Jesus's life? What, what happened just before here that makes, helps make sense of what we're about to read? So at the end of chapter one, what we find is that Jesus heals a leper. Now, if you remember uh, what a leper is, so a leprosy, the, the skin condition, but in Israel, if you had leprosy, you were completely outside of the community. There was no way that you would be included in any way, shape, or form with anything to do with the temple, which was the center of their community. You were an outsider. You were the lowest of the low, and what Jesus does, he heals this leper, he touches him, and then he says this. Jesus says this to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. So he heals him. See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. So Jesus heals someone who would have been on the complete outside of the community. And this is what he doesn't do. He doesn't say, now that I've healed you, uh, can you go ahead and give me a like on Facebook and follow me on Twitter and Instagram and follow, you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel. He says quietly, just, just don't tell anyone what I did. And just go your own way, show it as a proof to the priest, and live your life in response to what happened. And then he does this. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. So Jesus is beginning to blow up. His ministry is going, I don't know, you can't call it worldwide, like it's going like, 
region-wide, right? People are hearing about this mystic, this healer who is healing people and has this power over nature and has this power over sickness. And then we get to this point. And this is one of the scenes in the Gospels that is most uh, special because it's in Jesus' home. You actually don't find anywhere else where you see Jesus at home. Let me read to you the first couple of verses again. And when he entered, when he returned to Capernaum, which was where he, uh, where he lived for most of his public ministry life, when he entered into Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. So Jesus is at home. And in fact, scholars believe that Jesus moved in with his boy Peter. And so Peter owned a home just by the sea because Peter was a fisherman, and he moved in with Peter. But nevertheless, this is a very rare moment. This is where Jesus slept, right? This is where Jesus had his meals. This is where he would have spent most of his time during his public ministry. Jesus was home in Capernaum. Even though he was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, this was his home. And you can imagine Jesus' fame is growing. The paparazzi is about, and all he's doing is he's teaching them the word. That's what he chooses to do with his fame. He, he, he's teaching them the word. Now, Peter's house, Peter's house was pretty sizable for the time. I actually have a photo here that I took while I was there. I know, that's a humble brag. Uh, and so I took, I took this photo of, of what would have been Peter's home at the time. Now, at the moment, on top, there's this humongous and beautiful modern Catholic church. Uh, but this is what they uncovered, and this was probably where Peter lived. And I can imagine, then, this may be the very place where this takes place, this very room. And so to enter into this story, this is what we're thinking. We're not thinking about this auditorium. We're not thinking about this huge place where, uh, you know, Jesus is mic'd up and he's preaching to the masses. He's in a small stone-clad room with a mud roof, and he's just opening up the Word of God to them. And this is what it would have looked like. Jesus would have been sitting down. You would have seen that doorway there crammed with people. So we're thinking maybe 50, 150 people crammed in there. Just waiting on bated breath what he's going to say. And so are we there? Like in our minds, can we transpose ourselves there? Can we sense what is happening in the room? Jesus is blowing up thanks to his agent, right? The leper, the former leper, sorry, the former leper. He's going about sharing what he's done. And so he's blown up. He's, he's running a Bible study at GC. The place is packed. And then this happens. Come with me to verse 3. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. They unroofed the roof. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And so these mysterious figures, right? There's no names. There, there's no sort of identifiable uh, uh, information that we have of who they were. They're just these four men and this paralytic. But they realize what they need from Jesus. His famous spreading, they've heard about him probably healing the leper or doing this or doing that or the other. And they want to get close to him. They need to get close to him. And whether they believe he's this long-awaited Messiah that Israel was waiting for or not, whether they believe that he was God or not, I, I, the text doesn't say, and I'm not even really sure that they do. All they know is that they have this paralytic friend who is in pain, and they need to get him to Jesus. All they know is that when sick people come close to him, they get healed. And so they go up onto the roof, which wouldn't have been hard. These homes back then would have had an external staircase up onto the roof. And so they go onto the roof made of mud and sort of loose materials and hay, and they unroof the roof. Like no DA approval. They don't go to council to see if they could do this. They just go ahead and do it. Their desperation leads them to do this. And all they do is place this man, this paralytic. Right? We don't even get his name. Like how demeaning is that? That all he is known for is for his affliction. And they put him down at the feet of Jesus. And there's so many wonderful things happening here. But the, the one thing that I want us to take away today, one of the three, one of the highlights here is this, that this story shows us that we must move from thinking about our discipleship, our relationship with Jesus as individualistic to communal. 
that we actually need others. See, we live in an age of hyper-individualism. This is our default. We are born into this. We are discipled by our culture into this, that we remain at the center of the universe. Everything is about us, even the way that we engage in relationships. As long as they benefit me, as long as my job gives me satisfaction, everything is about us. And I don't think I need to spend too much time convincing you of this, but this is true all the way down, even to the way that we operate in churches, even the way that we engage our discipleship. Now, let me just say that I'm not against individualism per se. We are individuals, and there's something beautiful about that. There's something unique about that. In fact, there's this beautiful picture in the book of Revelation that says that when we see Jesus, he will give us a white stone. And on that white stone is a name that no one else knows except you and him. So there, I'm I'm not saying that we get washed away, that our personalities get washed away into a nothingness. Individualism matters. But in our age of hyper-individualism, where all that matters, where the most important thing is who I am has unleashed confusion and grief and pain in our world. It's gotten so endemic that we actually think that we can follow Jesus on our own. That somehow we have believed the lie that we can do this apart from community. Right? And, and so uh, church becomes something that is either peripheral or just completely optional. As long as me and Jesus are cool, it's all good. And what this story is telling us is that we need others. That we really need others. And even churches begin to speak of themselves as just ways to help you prop up your faith on your journey with your Jesus. And you end up making Jesus into your image. Asking to bless your life and fulfill your dreams and baptize your plans. And the fact of the matter is that we are far more connected to one another and we need one another far more than we think. And there's no other way around this. We were made by a community. We were made for a community. We were made in a community. And this story shows us something profound. It shows us that there are times where we can't get ourselves to Jesus. That there are times where we need to be carried about by others around us. And isn't this good news for us today? That it doesn't all depend on me. Isn't it good news that when you have no desire to pray, your friend can lift you, your friend can lift you up? Isn't it good news that when you have no desire to come to church, your friends can encourage you to come and lift you up? Isn't it good news that when spiritual attack comes, you can have friends to say, you know what, you just lay on your mat, we will take you to Jesus. And somehow, because we've drunk the Kool-Aid of hyper-individualism, we don't, think, we don't think that's okay. We think it needs to come from us. It needs to be our faith alone and ours alone. But this text shows us a different story. It's a story that tells us that when we are too weak to pray, who's been there? I mean, am I alone here when I've just been too weak to pray, too angry at God to pray, too disappointed to pray? When we're too weary to go to gospel community, when we're too distracted to fast, when we're too shameful to approach the throne of grace, when we are believing the lie that we have messed up too much, we've gone too far, we have sinned too much, this story reminds us that we can have friends to carry us into the presence of Jesus. It's 2014, and I know some of you at that point, uh, 2014, and we joined Anchor Church. Sydney. And I don't want this to be, uh, you you do with it what what you want, but that begun some of the hardest years of our life. This is a a plug for you to join this church. (laughs) It just seemed like everything went wrong for us. There was sickness, and some of you were there with us. Uh, There was deep affliction and injuries and chronic pain. There was one year where before we had Evangeline, Evangeline is our, how old is she? She's six. Uh, we had spent, uh, in one calendar year, Catherine, myself, and my two boys, nine hospitalizations in one year. This wasn't a doctor visit. This was being hospitalized for several different things. I mean, from pneumonia to, I had meningitis. It was wild. It was a wild couple years. We felt like we were in the furnace of affliction. We were kind of getting out of it, and then what we think, Catherine gets bitten by a a white-tailed spider. 
Right? She's in bed for weeks, just with sores. And then she, we go out, she, get, she kind of gets better, we go out on a date. It's like the first date in like four years that we had. And so I enter a chicken wing eating competition, and I get to the <laughs> second, uh, second to last round, right? And uh, it, was, it was just a great night. And then we go get ice cream, and then she breaks her foot. She has a navicular fracture and a Liz Frank injury, and that really has set the tone for the rest of our lives. So she lives with chronic pain, and it's been a journey to, to travel through with that. But that was some of the lowest moments in our life. I mean, the anger, the disappointment, the, the depression that set in. Times where we could not get ourselves to church. And then we had friends who would send us things, who would buy us groceries, uh, who were really, really there for us. And I remember one time getting to our apartment, and this was, this was there. And this, this is, I mean, it's stained, it's ugly. It's been on our fridge for six years. This here, this little thing has been our mat that we've laid on as we felt like paralytics, not able to get to Jesus, but our friends were able to get us to Jesus. And I want to read this to you. Uh, and this is our really, like this meant the world to us. I'm not going to put you on blast of, of, of who you were, uh, but this is what they said to us just right in the middle of the furnace of our affliction. I said, oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stone. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be, for, you, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear and far from terror, for it shall not come near you. And the beautiful thing is that the scripture reference there was wrong, which comforts us because we feel that we need to get all the right words and we need to make sure that all of our references are right. And then the note says, Dear Catherine, we pray that God would be with you to uplift you through all of your troubles and strengthen you to serve him with joy. Smiley face. This, for us, I cannot tell you. This, this yellow, discolored, coffee-stained, piece of paper over and over again sits on our refrigerator as a mat for us because when we felt paralyzed by shame and fear and anger and confusion, we had friends around us to put us into the presence of Jesus, to do the hard work of, of going up on the roof and unroofing the roof and lowering us at his feet. That is what we needed. And in the midst of all that pain, all that doubt, all that anger, we received a mat. And so we need to move from thinking that our relationship with Jesus can thrive individualistically. We need one another. We need to move from an individualistic faith to a communal forms of discipleship. At this rate, we're going to be here forever, so let's move on. Verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, I'm going to stop there for a moment. When Jesus saw their faith, what does that actually mean? Right? So they climb up on the roof, they dig it out, they lower their boy onto the floor, Jesus. And you can imagine Jesus side-eyeing Peter like, oh, I'm sorry. We'll call the roof, Tyler. Do you have insurance? Like none of that's happening. It doesn't seem to phase Jesus or Peter or whoever else is there. And Jesus, in this text, says that he saw their faith. And this is the next shift that we need to make. That faith is not primarily an operation of the mind. But it is an embodied response to who Jesus is. That's what faith is. Jesus saw something. He didn't sense something. He didn't mind read or heart read or, or whatever. He saw something. Faith was the embodied act of the four friends lifting their friends onto the roof and lowering them down. Faith is not just something that we think or feel. For faith to be faith, it must do something. Faith acts. And in this case, that act is going through the roof to get to Jesus. Jesus' brother says so much in James, where he says this, James chapter 2. 
He says this from verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is it? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And he goes down in verse 26 where he says this, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Faith does something, but Christianity has not only been run by hype, overrun by hyper-individualism, but it's also been overrun by this idea that primarily our lives are lived in the head that we somehow separate ourselves, right, mind and body, and we can actually separate the two. And what we've done is that we've, we have a focus on humanity's ability to understand and overcome the world through human reason. And so we overcompensate here. We think that all of our life is lived in the head, that it's all about cognition, it's all about knowing something, and that faith is something that we think. Now, surely it includes the thinking, it includes the cognitive abilities, but faith is something that we do. It is an embodied response to who Jesus is. Jesus saw something. He saw what they did, and he called it faith. It's not just what we believe inside of our minds about him, although it includes that. And this is why this is so beautiful for us, beautiful for us because we can pray that prayer, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. With faith being an action, we don't need to fear this idea of doubt. That doubt is not the enemy of faith. That even when we are doubting in our minds, in our hearts, we can still walk in faithfulness to Jesus. We can still do the thing that he's calling us to do. And that there is faith. That despite what you feel, you still come. I know not all of you want to be here. But despite what you may feel, you do it. Despite what you feel, you do it. Despite what you think, you decide to step out in faith. And even when doubts arise, you know you can step out and walk in faithfulness in response to the faithfulness of Jesus. Doubt itself can actually become an accelerant on the fire of faith. Because as you step out, even when you don't think you want to, and you trust him, that can grow your faith. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus, Jesus responds. Jesus responds to faith. Jesus responds to you. This is wild because sometimes we have this, this sort of flat view of the world where God's in control and maybe we think we have free will or not. We're not really sure. But Jesus responds to faith. God responds to our action. Jesus responds to the embodied responses to him, And this is the beautiful mystery of joining God in the renewal of all things. And so we need to make the shift from seeing faith as primarily an operation of the mind and seeing it as an embodied response to who Jesus is. So let's continue here at the end of verse 5. All right, so, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say. And just by the way, like once, once we get to this point and you have Jesus reading these guys' minds, like I, I, I hope that if that ever happens to us, we would we begin to shift our thinking here, but they, they, they remain. Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So I'm saying, can you imagine now? You're there. You're an onlooker. 
and you're seeing these four men lower this paralytic onto the feet of Jesus. You're there. And the first thing that Jesus says is your sins are forgiven. Like this should shock us. Because what we need to understand about Jesus is that his, his love is just pulsating through his body. And the thing is, the mystery is the first thing he does. It says your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you want to be, I don't know, more pious than what you are. But let me tell you, that sounds disappointing to me. Like, I didn't come to get my sins forgiven. I came to walk. I came to move. I came to have my body free of this pain. It's the kind of disappointment. When you order your six-piece and you find out they put sweet and sour sauce in the back, that level of disappointment. And so he's there, he's like, like he's still hurting. Like you can imagine his body, other parts of his body maybe overcompensating for the pain, overcompensating for the fact that he can't move. And what a disappointment. You came to move freely. Now, your sins are forgiven, but you're still a paralytic. What does this text have to say to us? We think, great, great. Can you imagine the, the disappointment on the four friends? Like, man, we just broke our back trying to get this guy here. And you just pronounce forgiveness of sins. And then you have this, these, these other characters, these scribes, are like, yo, who does this guy think he is? Like, all right, he's blowing up. He's got the blue tick of certification on Twitter. He thinks he's somebody now. And now he's starting to forgive sins. Like, nobody but God can forgive sins. So Jesus, being really Jesus, he says, bet. You don't believe that I have authority to forgive sins on earth? Walk. What a boss. Like, just, I can't, Im like, he's just phenomenal. And he walks. And the man walks. Imagine that you're Jesus in the story. Imagine you are teaching and you see someone come down, a paralytic, and the first thing, like you, you see him, and you don't only see his condition, but you see his heart. You see to the depth of him. You know him better than he knows himself. And you know what he needs. You know what he desires. You know he desires to be made whole. And the first thing he does is he forgives his sin. Why? This is the third shift that we need to make because we need to move from seeing our deepest need as something that is physical from understanding that it is relational. That the deepest need of everyone in this room, I don't know you all very well, but I know this, that the deepest need of every single one of us in this room is relational, not physical. Now I wanna say this, I'm not saying that the physical doesn't matter. The physical matters. One day, God will renew all things. We're not going to end up in the sky somewhere without bodies. We will end up embodied here in the renewed heavens and the renewed earth. The physical matters. Jesus cares about this man's pain. He wants to see him walk in wholeness. He wants to see you walk in wholeness. Jesus cares about shalom the fullness of wholeness on this earth. I'm not saying that he didn't care about his impediment. I'm not saying that God doesn't care about your physical pain. He will renew all things. And God's answer to your prayer of healing is always yes. Always yes. The question is, is it going to happen in this age or the age to come? We will be healed. That's not a question. The question is, is it going to happen in this age or the next? And so I just want to say, state really clearly what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the physical doesn't matter. Nevertheless, this text has something for our secular modern age. It confronts us when we think that the primary thing we need is what we can see, touch, taste, or smell. When the very primary thing we need is found in our relationship with God. I'm all for political engagement. But when we say what we really need is to get this party in power or to get that policy passed, and then all things will be well. I'm all for wise financial stewardship, but the idea when we say that what we really need is financial freedom and prosperity and then all things will be okay is not going to lead to human flourishing. 
I'm all for great education. My wife is a teacher. Many of you are teachers. I respect that that is a holy calling. But the idea when we say that what we really need is education and then all things will be well, all the ills of the world will be eradicated, will not lead to human flourishing. I want this church to be indelibly marked by a heart for justice and equity across all different stratums. And yet, when we say that what we really need is equality, and then all things will be made well, will leave us wanting. And then we say, well, what I really need is this relationship, and then all things will be well in my life. What I really need, if I just had more money, if I was just healthier, if I was just more confident, if I wasn't depressed, if I didn't suffer from social anxiety, if I wasn't debilitated with chronic pain every single day, if we can just advance technologically enough, if I can just find meaning and purpose in my work, if I can just raise kids who follow Jesus, if I can, if I can, if I can, then all things will be well. And this text is moving us from that lie to say all those things are important. They're just not the primary thing. That the deepest need that we have, the deepest problem that humanity has, is not physical, but relational. And Jesus sees that in the paralytic. As he's laying there in pain, loving him like no one else can love him, he pronounces his forgiveness of sins. And so you may have come here wanting a pep talk, wanting maybe to feel better about yourself, wanting to find community, all things that are good, very good. And yet your deepest need will not be met by any of those. Your deepest need is to come face to face with your creator and hear the words of forgiveness. That daughter, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. That there is enmity, there's strife between us and God. And the way that direction is important in scripture. It says that we have enmity towards God, not God toward us. And this idea that there's this angry God just waiting for you to accept Jesus and then he'll love you is completely backwards. We have a God who the cross doesn't make God love us. We know that, right? The cross, what happened on the cross does not change God's mind for you. It reveals it. It proves it. That there's enmity there and yet, and yet we go after what we can see and touch and smell and taste, thinking that those are our deepest problems. One day those will be healed. One day there will be good government, if you believe it or not. Like one day there will be perfect government, perfect ruling, perfect relationships, perfect bodies with no pain and no shame. But our deepest and most felt need is not what we can feel on the surface. But it's this relationship between us and God. And this is your invitation today, that if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to, to take these three shifts and ask the Holy Spirit today, what, what's one that you can take away with you? The shift from an individualistic to communal discipleship, throwing yourself, giving yourself to a local body that's not impressive. We're not impressive. Like, you will be disappointed. But throwing yourself into community because we cannot live individualistically. The second shift is from seeing faith as primarily something in the mind, something that we actually embody as a response to Jesus. And from thinking that your deepest problem, the third one, from thinking that your deepest problem is physical to actually understanding that it is relational. That we come face to face with Jesus and we hear those words of love and forgiveness. And if you haven't done that, if you haven't pledged allegiance to Jesus, if you don't believe that you follow him today, I invite you to do that. The scriptures say that when one person repents, one sinner repents, someone who is trying to figure out life on their own, when one repents, there is a party in heaven. Like, that's wild. There's celebration in heaven. There is, like, angels are just rejoicing over the fact that someone has woken up to themselves and has denied the lie of the world that says we can make it on our own. And he's waiting for you to take that first step of faith. 
He's waiting for you with open arms, with gentle arms, with strong arms. Arms that can take your doubt. Arms that can shoulder your shame. Arms that will bear you up. Isaiah 40 reminds us that even young men get tired. I don't place myself in that like, category anymore. But apparently I hear young men still can get tired. But says he doesn't get tired. He doesn't weary of welcoming his kids home. And so I implore you to be reconciled to God. And you do that by simply making one small step of faith. Asking him to reveal himself to you. Thanking him for the forgiveness that's at the cross. For trying to make your own way in the world. Not just breaking a couple rules, but breaking his heart. And he's waiting for you like the father. In Luke 15, just waiting, looking, rejoicing. And today you can walk out of here knowing that in heaven you can be seated with Christ in power and glory today. And that one day when he comes back and he renews, when he renews all of it, that we are called up with him. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. Lord, even now before all of these uh, folk, I thank you for this mat in my hand. I thank you that you have been so gracious to me and Catherine and the kids. That even in the midst of pain and doubt and confusion, you lowered us by grace, by your body, into the presence of Jesus to receive what we needed. So help us to be people of hope. I pray for those who are far from you now, who are here for a specific reason, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that scales would drop and hearts would change and that they would see you as beautiful above all things and that they wouldn't believe the lie that they've messed up too much, gone too far, been out of church for too long, but that they would find home in you. And so we thank you for all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.